The Soviet Union. One of the largest empires to ever be drawn on a map, perpetual enemy of the West, and the favourite historical country of edgy 14 year olds the world over. I should know, I was one of them. It was and remains a bastion of memedom. A correctly timed blast of the national anthem will still elicit cackles of laughter from me. Perhaps the reason we continue to find humour in it is because the very nature of its governance, aside from the obvious harm it brought to millions, is inherently comical in its contradiction. It was a socialist government of the people that ruled with an authoritarian fist. It vanguarded a communist revolution that stagnated and never progressed. Things you did an action to would instead do that action to you, and it advocated for a society of equality and anti-decadence, while its leaders could be seen on posters and television every day living in the lap of luxury. It was no big secret that the higher you stood with the Communist Party, the more conveniences would be made available to you, and this of course goes for cars. Realistically, mere mortals could apply to have the chance to win the opportunity of purchasing three options. A Zaporozhet, Slava Ukraini, a Moskvich, or a Zhiguli, better known in the West as the Lada. Even then, you had to be a fairly high-ranking member of society, such as a commanding officer in the army, if you wanted to receive your Zhiguli on a time scale that wasn't measured in years. Above that was the Gaz Volga, the most luxurious car officially offered to individual owners, although very few could afford them. They were mostly relegated to favoured officials, taxi services, and of course the police and KGB, leading to the numerous urban horror stories of black Volgas. Then there were the two levels of limousine available only to the highest echelons of the Communist Party. Shrouded in mystery, details on these vehicles have only become public knowledge following the collapse of the Soviet Union, as they were built in strict secrecy and maintained by a dedicated unit of the KGB. The lower of these two was the Gaz Chaika, whose first generation was deliberately styled to ape the American Packard, and whose 5.5 litre V8 similarly tried to emulate commodified capitalist muscle. The second generation has more unique styling, and actually looks pretty damn good from some angles, although influences from early 70s Chrysler products can clearly be seen. But the cream of the crop, the flag-bearing limousines of the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics that carried Khrushchev and Brezhnev during the heights of the Cold War, were those produced by Zill. Initially styled after Chrysler produced Imperials, with later facelifts adopting a more unique look, these enormous slab-sided land yachts were powered by even larger V8s, receiving engines with 6, 7, and 7.7 litres as time progressed. These enormous power plants were all but required to move the tons of redundant electrical systems, Corellian birch trim, and fattened geriatric general secretaries that accompanied the car. However, even these vehicles reserved for the peak of Soviet society were not immune to the general malaise of the USSR. Even when the exterior was given a refresh every decade, much of the technicals underneath remained very closely related to the original vehicles first produced in the 60s or even 50s. This proved a problem when the funny birthmark man came to power. Look at the top of his head! <laughs> Gorbachev's cooling of relations with the West led to certain Western intrusions into the USSR. McDonald's, the glowing yellow symbol of Western consumerism, established a restaurant in Moscow in January of 1990. Other luxurious Western commodities like jeans and cola were becoming easier to come by, and although expensive goods like cars weren't on the table yet, Russian car manufacturers, who had long since seen their export markets dry up as they failed to keep up with competition, recognized a need to make up for decades of lost development, or potentially face losing their domestic market. As aspirational as the future looked, with peaceful Western cooperation on the horizon, Opening up to the Western world meant Russian manufacturing would have to catch up fast. Zaz, AZLK, and Vaz developed Latavria, Aleko, and Samara, which couldn't quite keep up with the times, but made shocking progress considering what they made previously. But that's a subject for a different video. What even less people in the West know about is what the Soviet luxury manufacturers, Gaz and Zil, were preparing for the impending Western onslaught. comment section on this video is gonna be... just great. The first order of business was a rationalization, 
The endless bureaucracy of Soviet administration had resulted in a complicated model lineup with certain oddities. Highly specialized models, previous generation vehicles produced for years alongside their supposed replacements, and of course the general antiquated look. What would unfortunately not be dropped is the endlessly imaginative naming scheme of Soviet vehicles that looks like they're categorizing SCPs. When there's a Wikipedia page explaining how the system works, you know you've got a problem. The other requirement was that these cars had to have some export capability, which meant that they'd have to be able to compete with the best of the German executive brands on NATO turf. After all, the best defense is a good offense. Considering that Russian car production hadn't changed much since 1970, this was a tall order. But the fate of Russian car manufacturing was at stake. While the threat of nuclear annihilation was postponed under Gorbachev's rule, Gaz and Zil knew that for them, the Cold War could suddenly become very hot at a moment's notice. With funding approved from the central government and a national sector on their shoulders, Gaz and Zil set to work. Gaz planned to offer three variants of an executive saloon based on an all-new monocoque platform, with an entry-level front-wheel drive model in the form of the 3103 and an all-wheel drive option called the 3104. These were meant to tackle the West's mid-size offerings, such as the W124E class and Audi 100, while an all-wheel drive extended wheelbase range topper dubbed, you guessed it, the 3105, was intended to compete with the likes of the BMW 7 series. Gaz opened fire with the 3105, a surprisingly modern wind-cheating car created after studying the rising star of the premium market, Audi. Unfortunately, prototypes featuring an impossibly low window line wouldn't make it to the pre-production stage. It wasn't just a new body, either. For the first time in decades, the 3105 featured a brand new chassis, with modernities such as the aforementioned all-wheel drive, all-independent suspension, front and rear disc brakes, power-assisted rack and pinion steering, and ABS supplied by Bosch. Bosh! Likewise, the interior was to come fitted with contemporary luxuries, such as electrically adjustable seats, a six-speaker stereo system, optional leather upholstery, and an analog clock. All old news for the products of consumerism, but shocking progress considering Gaz was still making this at the time. Also new was the 3.4-litre V8 that powered it. Designated the Gaz 321, it featured overhead cams and two valves a cylinder. Initial prototypes were fed by ancient carburettors of 50s vintage, which, knowing the USSR, were probably made of pure polonium and gave passing pigeons malevolent tumours. A single-point Lucas fuel injection system was also trialled, with at least one prototype receiving a modern multi-point EFI setup. In single-point form, the new engine produced 170 horsepower, disappointing for a 3.4-litre, but something that could be remedied with the multi-point system. There were also whispers that this somewhat undersized V8 was planned to be expanded to as much as 5.5 litres in later models. While the extended wheelbase 3105 was reaching the road, planned mid-size 3103 and 3104 variants were hashed out. These were set to be powered by the new ZMZ 405 and 406, four bangers in 2.5 and 2.3 litre displacements respectively, with multi-point EFI, dual overhead cams, and 16 valves, good for around 150 horsepower. Some sources say that a V6 was the intended power plant for the 3104, possibly called the ZMZ 310, although I found no further details on it besides a general displacement of 3 litres. Additionally, it's likely that the Gaz 560 four-pot turbo diesel was to be fitted as well, keeping the 310 family of cars in line with the European trend for thrifty, soot-spitting saloons. All these features combined would at least form the basis of a perfectly cromulent executive car, and with the support of the Soviet government, what could possibly go wrong? A couple of years before, over at Zill, an altogether much larger project would begin to take shape. Tasked with filling the role of the USSR's ultra-luxury segment, and potentially taking the fight to the decadent West, Zill similarly had one hell of a task on their hands. To beat your enemy, you have to know your enemy, and engineers reportedly studied the Rolls-Royce Silver Spirit, W126S Class, and Cadillac DeVille when designing the successor to the 41041. Fortunately, a digit from the name would be dropped, and the new car would be available in two primary versions an extended wheelbase seven-seater, the 4101, and a still earth curvature followingly long four-seater called the 4102. A mixture of its influences, along with Zill's own design language, can be seen in the 4102's body shape, although it still looks more modern than all of them. Zill clearly did their own homework. 
It even fares okay against cars that debuted after it, such as the W140 and Lexus LS. I must admit, I have a real soft spot for the looks of this car. I don't think I've ever seen a car as imposing. Its sheer length creates an illusion of a sinister low-cut roofline, and it just seems to ooze power from every angle. Not in a horsepower sense, but a, well, authoritarian one. Sketches show a desire to clean up the front end with corner lights and the potential for a convertible to be offered. To bring the Soviet limo into the modern era, Zill started anew and employed the use of a monocoque chassis for the first time in its history. Fiberglass was used in some body panels to help reduce weight, but this didn't stop it weighing around two and a half tons. There was also a fresh start for the engine, of which three were to be offered. A 6-litre V8, a 4.5-litre V6 derived from it, and a 7-litre diesel V8. Nothing is known about these engines. They may never even have made it off the drawing board. To get the prototypes moving for testing, they were fitted with the huge 7.7-litre V8 of the then-extant Zill family, an engine that dated back to the late 50s. A few sources claim the 4102 sent its power through the front wheels exclusively, but other sources contradict this, and it raises the question of this clear drive shaft tunnel and the largest center console in the known universe. I can only imagine it was intended for Soviet officials to run makeshift war games on. On that center console, you'll find a radio, cassette player, and controls for the dual zone aircon, just the first of many luxuries available to the passengers of the 4102, including individually adjustable power seats front and rear, a voice synthesized warning system, along with a 10 speaker sound system for the Premier's banging tunes. Like the Gaz, it was also to feature independent suspension, optional leather seats, all round disc brakes, and power rack and pinion steering. The fact Gaz and Zill were able to produce these cars despite not having started anew in around 20 years is a testament in itself. But despite the talent of the engineers in Nizhny Novgorod and Moscow, building the cars was only the first of many obstacles. Firstly, these government-sponsored projects suddenly became unsponsored in 1987, leaving Gaz and Zill to develop them with what little money they had. This is likely what led Gaz to focus on the 3105 and Zill to fit the 4102 with their existing engine and cut corners on front-end styling. The first of the two to bite the dust was the Zill. Some sources claim three were produced, although two can be identified, a bronze car and a black one. These were nicknamed Mishka and Reka, I barely know her, and presented to Mikhail Gorbachev for his approval upon the completion of the second car in 1988. Heart-wrenchingly, he didn't like them, and declined to commission them into Kremlin service. My comrade in socialism, you ordered the car, yet? This essentially killed off the model on the spot. The emperor had turned his thumb down. In reality, even if Gorbachev had accepted the car, the likelihood is that only a handful would have been made. Zill was primarily a truck company, and the few limos it did build were done so by hand in a dedicated workshop, with less than one made each week. Selling the 4102 abroad would have necessitated the construction of a production line, something Zill only had experience with in lorries, let alone a car as modern and complex as the 4102. Meanwhile, the withdrawal of funds for the 3105 had slowed progress on the project to a crawl. And before the car could reach the road, Gaz's worst nightmare happened. In 1991, the USSR dissolved. Gaz was too late. They had anticipated competition would arrive in Russia, but not this suddenly. Second-hand luxury cars with more prestigious names flooded in, while the automotive giants of the West began establishing their foothold in the motherland. Yeltsin ordered Gaz to produce 250 3105s a year, but without restoring funding to the project, even this couldn't be managed. And between 1992 and 1996, just 55 rolled out of the factory, each costing about the same as the 7 Series and S-Class they were supposed to undercut. What could Gaz do? They'd lost. They'd keep bloody fighting, that's what! When Napoleon marched through the gates of Moscow, what did Russia do? When the German and Austro-Hungarian empires invaded, what did Russia do? When the capitalist West sent their volunteers to fight alongside the imperialists in the Civil War, what did Russia do? When the fascists sought the very destruction of the motherland itself, what did Russia do? It fought back! Gaz wasn't going to roll over and go quietly into that good night. 
This is the country that defeated the Nazis, for God's sake. Gaz, in Russia's name, would fight back, go out, and conquer the- oh. For 1995, Gaz debuted the 2307 and 2308 Ataman, two- and four-wheel drive pickups that were also available as an SUV. Clearly, Gaz's attempts to mimic the likes of the Mercedes G-Wagon, it is likely they were to use the same new engine families as the 3105. Not so sure about the massive forehead look, though. The following year, one last push was made to get the 310 family to market, with the cheaper 3103 and 3104 variants being unveiled at that year's Moscow Auto Show. The exterior and interior were completely redesigned to keep up with modern times, now aping the successful Japanese luxury look that had risen to prominence since the Audi lookalike 3105, combined with a little retro reminiscent of the Rover 75 that debuted three years afterwards. Fitted with the 16-valve straight four, these were once again perfectly acceptable executive vehicles. It wasn't just the executive saloon market that Gaz had its eye on either. The success of the Range Rover and Land Rover Discovery were evidence of the emerging market for premium off-roaders, and Gaz, having long been a truck manufacturer, saw its opportunity, and in 1996 debuted the 3106 Ataman II. It is at this point that I must issue a disclaimer. You may have noticed that I haven't shown you a picture of the 3106 yet. That is because it is ugly to the point of being a cognito hazard. I am talking Pontiac Aztec levels of cosmically hideous. So with that out of the way, I am not legally responsible for any trauma this image may cause you. Look on, if you dare. Bulbous and bubbly in the same vaguely retro way as the 3103, but mapped onto a much bigger body. God, why'd you all let him cook? Fortunately, they remedied this almost immediately with a very Cadillac-influenced facelifted prototype. The Ataman II was to feature the same engines as the rest of the 310 family, including the diesel 4, mysterious V6, and larger V8. But of course, despite the countless hours of development poured into the new range, none of it would stick the landing. There was no triumphant western launch of the Volga Mark. They don't litter Russian classifieds. Hell, they never even made it to mass production. With Gaz putting in so much effort to develop a multi-model range covering most niches of the then extant premium market, you would have thought there'd be at least some buzz around the old Soviet factory that thought it could compete with BMW and Mercedes. But even in their home market, they were all but ignored. Years later, I had to dig through all sorts of poorly translated blogs to scrape together a picture of what these cars were like. The 3.4 V8 and elusive V6 were scrapped, while the 16-valve four-bangers were dropped in facelifted versions of the old Volga dating back to the 60s, as Gaz solemnly drifted into the 2000s. Since then, Gaz ceased all car production, and now only makes vans and trucks while Zill went bankrupt altogether in 2013, and now only exists as a shell company while the factory is torn down for redevelopment. It's obvious why the new Gaz and Zill wouldn't have flown in the West. They were only at best as good as their competition when they needed to be five times better to even get a foot in the door. Lexus was the newest name in luxury around the same time, and it stuck by having billions in development and market research behind it, and trouncing the competition at nearly half the price, with Toyota making a loss on each car to make sure it sold well and became an established brand. Beyond that, Japanese manufacturers had spent the previous 30 years building something you can't buy, an image of quality by selling reliable family cars, building their reputation and preparing their customers for the idea of a Japanese luxury car. Gaz and Zill were so cash-strapped that they struggled to get their cars on a production line, while Soviet manufacturers have been peddling the automotive equivalent of asset flip shovelware to prospective buyers for decades. Gaz and Zill could have thrown everything they had, but the yuppie in the market to buy something to park terribly and undertake at 90 miles an hour in was never going to buy a socialist. Meanwhile, the former Eastern Bloc was aspirational, looking to leave its past behind and adopt the artifacts of a successful Western life. Why would they want to drive a moving symbol of KGB oppression, to become the driver of the Black Volga? They'd revolted against their ruling autocracies for a reason. There's an alternative universe where funding isn't withdrawn from Gaz and Zill in 1987. Gorbachev gives the 4102 the green light. The Soviet Union lasts a bit longer, doesn't explode so violently, and slowly begins to cooperate with the rest of the world. Gaz and Zill are given more time and money to develop production bases for their new cars, and maybe, for a time, 
you are able to buy a modern Volga or Zill in the West. In this world, maybe, just maybe, we realize the potential of those Soviet engineers who for decades were kept under the thumb of a repressive government and the workers in the factories at Moscow and Nizhny Novgorod who have long since lost their jobs as Putin and his oligarch cronies bled Russia of whatever was left. Maybe, in this other world, everything turned out okay. Instead, life gave us, and especially the Russian people, a lot of lemons. And there's only so much lemonade you can drink before you get sick. Hello, I'm having to re-record the introduction to the unscripted segment because after I recorded that the other day, L Laserpig sent his subscriber base to raid the channel and in the space of about 24 hours, I went from just under a thousand subscribers to almost 5,000. I'm speechless. That's incredible. Thank you so, so much. Uh, if any of you have stuck around, that genuinely means the world to me. It's this. This has been a roller coaster of a day. <laughs> so, as per usual, I'm just gonna cover some things I wasn't able to fit into the rest of the script for whatever reason. So, firstly, why did Gorbachev cancel the Zill 4102? Aside from the obvious surface reason that he just didn't like it, there is a particular reason he didn't like it. Under the Gorbachev regime, very famously, the policies of Perestroika and Glasnost were introduced. Particularly important here is Perestroika, which meant restructuring. It was basically an attempt to tackle the privileges that only the upper echelons of the party experienced, try to cancel out some of that inequality in the Soviet Union. It was under Perestroika that the blueprints for the Gaz-14 Chaika were destroyed. The idea being that with the blueprints destroyed and production of the car ceased, that would be one less luxurious thing kept only for the members of the party. As such, it's reasonable to believe that Gorbachev would disapprove of a brand spanking new limo meant only for the very, very upper echelons of the party. Secondly, not long after the first Gaz 3105s rolled off the production line, they took it rallying. At least two different cars, actually, were raced in rallies around Russia. Fantastic. It's also interesting to note that many of the concepts featured iterative facelifts and designs. Even in the quote-unquote production 3105s, the 55 they managed to make, many of them had different interiors, different dashboards. Take the 3106, there were two different versions of the facelift. I can't specifically speak as to why this is the case, why they didn't just decide on a single thing and go with it, rather than constantly trying to redesign it as they did. Maybe it's a symptom of the Soviet system? and that corporate culture, maybe, that was embedded into Gaz? Who knows? The final thing I'll touch on is, while I can't do an overall analysis of how the Russian car industry exists today, that would require a video of its own, I will touch on that Russia has tried to dip its toe back into the luxury automotive industry with Aorus. When I say Russia has, I mean a Kremlin-owned company paid Porsche to do it. Putin's Russia, everyone. Just some special thanks before I head out. Firstly, colossal thank you to Decenerf on Twitter for putting together that stunning thumbnail. It's far better than I could possibly have imagined. My friends Pine and Harv for, again, being unwitting test subjects for the video. And a final special thanks to Laserpig and Anamaki for sharing my channel around. Seriously, again, Really massive thank you, can't say that enough, and everyone who stuck around following Laserpig's 300k subspecial. Like I said before, it's been a wild ride. And with that, I hope to see you in the next video. Or I'll kill you. Bye-bye. <laughs>